teaching writing mechanics and conventions using minimal class time. Dr. Judy Landrum. This workshop will describe and model how to determine which types of conventions, grammar and punctuation, to mark or discuss for a variety of levels of students, from the AAAS student to the doctoral level. In addition, a strategy for using a small amount of class time, let's say 20 to 30 minutes through the course of a, of a whole class, to work on writing conventions will be explained. So let me start out by just setting the context. If you have a child or even a middle schooler and you take them into their room which is a disaster and you say go clean up your room, they're going to give you one of two or three responses. One response may be they shove everything under the bed or shove everything in the closet and try to shut the door and pretend it doesn't exist. Another response is they're overwhelmed. They completely shut down because they don't know where to start and they don't know what to do because it's just too big, it's too much to do. Another response is they'll leave the messes all over the room and then they'll just try to vacuum around the messes as a way to clean the room. And none of those three things work. And it's kind of like that when we pick up a whole stack of student papers. We look at them and say, I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know where to start on giving them feedback on how to fix their mechanics. So what we may do is, after we're overwhelmed, then the next thing we do is we mark every single grammatical error on their paper but that doesn't fix the mess because all that does is shove it and try to put it away because they haven't learned how to correct their mechanics. All we've done is point out where they are to them. So the purpose of this workshop is to give you some tools as Bethel faculty so you know how to help your students clean up their grammar and punctuation messes in their writing. Specifically, we have three objectives for this workshop. One, as participants, you will be able to apply writing instruction practices, kind of a mini lesson, that enables your students to improve the quality of their writing content using a minimal amount of time. Two, participants will be able to apply writing instruction practices, again, a mini lesson, that enables their students to reduce students' mechanical errors, conventions, mechanics, punctuation in their writing. And three, participants will be able to evaluate which writing and grammar and punctuation errors to focus on with their students instead of trying to give them everything, in which case they won't know which ones to work on. They'll, they'll get nothing if you give them too much. Specifically, in the video, we're going to do three things to meet the objectives. First, review a system to determine the order of holistic or global items to look on in your student's writing. Two, review a hierarchy of mechanical conventions. So as a professor, you know, okay, for this class, I will focus on these three or four mechanical errors. For this class, which has graduate students, I'm gonna focus on these errors. You know which ones to focus on for which level of students. And three, model this process with the freshman level paper. So first of all, what we're gonna do is look at a rubric and this is a writing rubric for AAAS content level. So let's say this is the rubric you're using in an AAAS writing class. So what you're doing is you've picked up a set of student papers and you're giving whole class feedback and you're going to tell them two or three things that deal with their content that you want to focus on, such as maybe it's organization or thesis focus or something like that. And you're looking and you say, hmm, I don't know where to focus. There's 15 things I could say, but you only want to say two or three because if you give them 15, they'll go into cognitive overload and they won't be able to do anything. So when you're picking the two or three, your first thing is, what's the most egregious error? What is the biggest problem I see here? Is it organization? Is it there's not a clear focus or thesis? And go with that. If you're looking and you say, I don't know what the biggest error is, then you go back to your rubric. Look at the categories in your rubric and then think, okay, among these categories, thesis, writing context, organization structure, what's the one I want to focus on? And then look at what we have written in each of the cells of the rubric to determine, okay, these are the things I want to talk about when I discuss this with my students. Now, you may say, well, Judy, that's great. That's an AAAS rubric, but I really want to have, you know, I'm working with doctoral students or I'm working with master students. We also have those rubrics available for you too. So you can look at those rubrics to decide what are the kind of things I need to focus on or talk to my students about. That's when you're looking at big picture content level. I am not going to spend time with you today reviewing that kind of a paper and looking at content because we already have a few videos that deal with that. Teaching students how to organize a text, 
and that is working with content organization. We have another video that is setting the stage for success, helping students to write a thesis. So you can look at those videos if you want to think, how do I deal with the content level part of my student's writing? Now, the next thing we're going to go to, which is the main focus of today, is how do I help my students with mechanical errors and which ones do I need to focus on and look at? So, first thing is we're going to go back to that AAAS rubric. And on the AAAS rubric, I want you to notice at the bottom, we've got mechanics and conventions. And at the mechanics conventions, it says, has mastered level one on conventions, held accountable for level two, but not necessarily mastered. And you may say, what in the world's level one? What's in the world's level two? Ta-da! Got the answer for you. Down here, we have explained what level one is with errors, that's grammar skills, and level two, which are basic punctuation skills. So I'm going to quickly go over these with you. So for beginning grammar skills, it's things like very obvious sub subject verb agreement errors, such as when Mitchell moved, he brung his secretary with him. Or when we was in the planning stages, we was concerned. Or Jones don't think it's acceptable. Those are pretty blatant, egregious grammar errors. Another level are obvious pronoun usage errors, such as him and Richards were the last ones hired, or we should respect she for using grammar correctly. Because we want our students to succeed, we create stellar Moodle sites for they. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to he. Notice all these examples I've given you are really incorrect, but they're, they're pretty obvious for native speakers. Another one will be watch colloquialisms. Often students will say would of when they mean to say would have, such as I would of gone to the meeting, but I finally, when it comes to grammar, make sure your students are writing in a consistent verb tense. So if they're writing in past tense, the entire text is past tense. If they're writing in present, it's all present or future. There are exceptions to that, but that should come out clear with the context. If you're setting up here's the past, here's the future, the context should cue the reader in on that. Now let's talk about beginning punctuation skills. When you're looking at beginning punctuation skills, probably the most obvious one is they should be able to do correct spelling. And spell check will help them to a point, but as you know, spell check doesn't always work, so they have to proofread also. The next level of beginning punctuation errors is to look at commas. And I'm not going to do every comma error, just the big ones. So when you're looking at the main comma errors, here are the ones you need to focus on at level one. First, use a comma after a dependent clause. You're probably doing this correctly, but you're not sure what the language, you may not be sure of the language. If you're not sure of the language, a dependent clause is a clause or a phrase with a subject and a verb, but it has an incomplete thought because it's dependent on the rest of the sentence to make sense. So it's a dependent clause. Example of that would be, when my students succeed, subject, verb, incomplete thought, comma, it makes all my efforts worthwhile. You also will put a comma after an introductory word. Example, nonetheless, comma, teachers give their best efforts whether their students succeed or not. Another common error at this level is students will put a comma after a verb. Rarely will a comma ever appear after a verb. Example, Cox cannot predict, shouldn't have a comma, that street crime will diminish. You also put a comma around a non-essential clause. Now, non-essential clauses have more specific names, such as the positive or parenthetical expression. Don't go there with your students. It's, it's too many details. Just say non-essential clause. And what's a non-essential clause? Real easy. It's a clause that's not essential to the meaning of the sentence. So if the sentence makes sense without the clause, you put commas around it. So that makes it easy to remember. Some examples. I've not eaten at McDonald's, I believe, for two weeks. I believe it's not essential, so you surround it by commas. Gandhi, comma, upon achieving an, Ind an Indian independence from Great Britain, comma, retired for public from public life. Again, that phrase in the middle is not essential to the meaning of the sentence. It's just more good information. It's surrounded by commas. Another example, training for marathons, which Tom does annually, weak and sneeze which Tom does annually. Again, another example of a parenthetical, well, excuse me, a non-essential clause. So it goes in, uh, so you surround it with commas. Incomplete sentences, you want to mark those. I think you know what those are. I'm not going to explain them to you. However, when you're working with grammar and mechanics, if they have an incomplete sentence in there for effect and it's effective, leave it. Because the main thing isn't, is it right or wrong, but is it conveying the message that needs to be conveyed to the reader? 
Finally, you want to correct run-on sentences, and that's a big one at this stage of writing. So here's an example of a run-on sentence. As is the case with the sentence written here, a run-on sentence is actually a sentence with multiple subject and verb combinations, presenting multiple ideas to the reader, and the reason it is a writing flaw is because the multiple ideas make it harder for the reader to follow rather than telling students it's wrong and just teach them to divide the run-on into two or three sentences for clarity. So that's an example of a run-on sentence that you want to fix. Finally, basic capitalization, like the first word of a sentence or proper noun and adjectives, they should be able to do those correctly. Again, you may say, gosh, you know, my students are more sophisticated than that. Um, what's the next level of errors that I need to work with? So if you're looking at the next level of errors, I'm going to take you to the most sophisticated, which is a rubric for EDD students. So with your EDD students, we'll go down here and say, at that level, they should have mastered levels one to three on the continuum of writing, and you still want to hold them accountable for levels four and five. And you say, what in the world are all those levels? Okay, we've covered levels one and two, and on this rubric, which is available to you by link, we've got all the other levels. Due to time concern, I'm not going to review them, but they are pretty self-explanatory. And at the bottom, I've got the resource, resources that those came from. Now, you may say, this is really good, but I don't use those rubrics. I designed these fabulous rubrics with TLT, so I don't have this information. Once again, we've got the information for you. So we have another handout for you, which basically shows the levels of mechanicals, errors, and the continuum. So you've got that to work with. And again, if you, so if you've got these fabulous rubrics you created with TLT, we still have this for you to work with so you know these are the kind of errors that I need to focus on with my students. If you look at that and say, yeah, but I, I, have, I have master's level students. I don't have EDD. I don't know what I need to do with them. To help you out, we also have designed for all the um, graduate students, CAP, Seminary, and GS, a rubric that has all levels, AA, a continuum of skills, whether you're talking about thesis writing, writing context, or whether you're talking about mechanics and conventions, that basically lists at all these levels what the skills students should have. So this should be a guide for you to help determine what's the level of my students, what should I be working on first, second, third, and so forth. So hopefully that information will help guide you to determine how to move forward with your students. Okay? Now the next phase that we're going to do with this workshop is we're going to work on a modeling exercise. So I'm going to model for you what this will look like if you're doing an exercise with your whole class showing them how to fix mechanical errors in their text. Again, 20 minutes once during the course, or maybe two, you'll do this twice for 10 minutes during the, the uh, course. This video is not going to review the entire process of giving feedback to student writing because, again, we have another video on that, which is, it makes sense, giving feedback on student writing when less is more. So that talks about the whole process for you. This video is just going to res model responding to a student essay. And when you do that, you want to do two or three things. One, the focus needs to be on conveying the message to the reader. Not, again, this is right, this is wrong, but how do we best convey the message to the reader? Because that's why we fix grammar and punctuation, to make a clear message to the reader. Secondly, again, you want to focus a little time on content, even though I'm not going to be doing it, what I model here. And then you want to give them three to five grammar punctuation errors that they're going to work on whole class. And you draw that from the pattern that you're seeing with all your student writers. And more than likely, the example I'm going to use here, it's going to be some of those level one, level two type of errors, particularly with undergraduate writers. More sophisticated writers, it would be a little bit again, more sophisticated. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is, first of all, we've got a text in front of you that we're going to work with. You notice at the top, I have all my students do this, and they're setting the writing context. So what she has here is her audiences, those who deal with people who have a fear of heights or have acrophobia. The writer or the role of the writer is someone on uh, a climbing wall staff. The purpose of the text is to educate people on how to deal with those who have a fear of heights. And the guiding question is, how do you help a person with heights? Okay? Now, I am going to shift from being a colleague talking to a colleague to pretending to be a teacher talking to a class of students because I'm modeling that process for you. So now, switching roles. Okay, class. Thank you for giving me your essays, and you did a really nice job. I saw a lot of improvements. Last, th last thing that you wrote, 
there were a lot of incomplete sentences. And you fixed that error, so I'm really pleased with that. Another thing I liked in your papers is I saw passion. I saw, I saw you writing about things that you cared about, and that came through clearly in your writing. So uh, kudos to you for making those changes. Now, we're going to look at an essay right now, and we're going to focus on spe some specific grammar skills. And the paper that I'm using, by the way, is one of your classmates. But I want you to know, I asked her permission to use her paper. She gave me permission in an email. And also, I want you to know, I can only use a good paper. Because if it's not a good paper, I can't really use it because you can't follow it. Also, I want you to know that I planted a lot of these mistakes in the paper because I want to teach you skills. She didn't make this many mistakes. I planted almost all of them in there, again, to teach you specific skills. The specific grammar skills we're going to work on today are these. We're going to work on voice, making sure you stay in third person or first or second, whichever the text is. In this case, it's third person. And we're going to work on also some um, comma skills. And the comma skills are, one, whenever you have two complete sentences joined by a conjunction, which is and, but, more, and, but, or, for, nor, yet then you put a comma after the first complete sentence. Secondly, you put a comma after a dependent clause. And if you wonder what a dependent clause is, a dependent clause is a phrase that is dependent on the rest of the sentence to make sense. So the dependent clause has a subject and a verb, but an incomplete thought. Third, after an introductory phrase. So when you have four more words, that's an introductory phrase. It's usually cleaner for the reader if you put a comma after that. Or if you have a singular word phrase like however, nonetheless, so, you want to put a comma after that word. And finally, putting commas around what's called a non-essential clause. And a non-essential clause is basically a phrase in a sentence which doesn't have to be there for the sentence to make sense, so you put commas around it. Finally, we're also going to work with run-on sentences. So the way this is going to work is for the first several sentences, what I will do is I will read the sentence as it is written, and if there is an error in the sentence, then I will go back and say, here is what the error is, here is how you correct it. And I will do that for several sentences. Then we will go back and I will do a sentence, I will read it as it is, and then have you figure out what the error is. Okay. So, sentence number one. On a trip to Devil's Lake, John was about to start rappelling down the slick face of Devil's Rock when a petrified look came across his face. No errors in that sentence. Next sentence. He started shaking and was looking at the rest of us with a blank stare smeared across his face. Okay, error in this sentence, we've gone from third person to first person plural by saying rest of us. So you can fix that by moving it back to third person by saying something such as, he started shaking and was looking at his friends with a blank stare or on his fellow rock climbers or another word or phrase but not us or you. Next sentence. Nevertheless, John slowly started to descend and eventually made it to the bottom safely. Okay, in this particular sentence, nevertheless, one word introduction, so you put a comma after that. Now, remember I told you there's a rule that if you have two complete sentences and you have a conjunction, you put a comma between the complete sentences? Here we have John slowly started to descend, complete sentence, but this is not a complete sentence. Eventually made it to the bottom safely. It's an incomplete sentence, therefore, we do not need this comma between the two sentences, and it needs to be eliminated. I don't think this is required, but I probably would put a comma after eventually, because I just think it makes the sentence flow a little bit better. And it is kind of a one-word transitional type word. So I'll read it with the comma. Nevertheless, comma, John slowly started to send and eventually made it to the bottom safely. Okay. Next sentence. The smile he was wearing showed how proud he was of his great accomplishment. Again, the area is we have a comma after a verb, which is unnecessary, so we need to delete that comma. Next sentence. After the climb, John told all of us that he was afraid of heights and that he almost backed out of the climb. Okay, we have two errors in that sentence. First of all, again, we have told all of us, that's moving from third person to, to first person, so we want to fix that, so it's something more like John told his friends or John told his fellow rock climbers or whatever. Secondly, as noted before, that he almost backed out of the climb is not a complete sentence. Therefore, you do not need the comma before the conjunction and. Next sentence. Luckily, John faced his fear of heights that day and now can live without being held captive by his fear. Luckily, comma, John faced his fear of heights that day and now can live without being held captive by his fear. We'll need a comma after luckily. Next sentence. P 
People's lives everywhere are threatened by a fear of heights. It consumes their thoughts and affects what they can do and where they can go. This is a run-on sentence because you have two complete sentences. People's lives everywhere are threatened by a fear of heights is sentence number one. Sentence number two, it, consum it consumes their thoughts and affects what they can do and where they can go. So you need to correct that one of three ways. Either A, you put a semicolon after heights, B, you put a comma and and after heights, or C, you put a period after heights and capitalize the first letter of the next word. Next sentence. This fear, otherwise known as acrophobia, is very prevalent in today's world. Kind of hard to follow, isn't it? The reason is we have a non-essential clause in here, known as acrophobia. So the sentence is much cleaner if it reads, this fear, comma, otherwise known as acrophobia, comma, is very prevalent in today's world. Now, I'm going to stop there, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read a sentence as it is written, then wait for you to find the error, and then you can tell me and the rest of the class what that error is. Okay, now I'm going to switch from being the teacher to being your colleague again. So what you would do from here is, in a face-to-face -face classroom, you read a sentence, or it's even better if you have a student read the sentence, so you're increasing their participation. So they read the sentence, and then what you would do is say, okay, what's the error, or is there an error? Wait until you get at least two-thirds to three-fourths of the students put their hand in the air before you call on someone. So you're giving them time to think through it. In an online environment, you would do something very similar, but what you would do is, instead of waiting to see hands in the air, you wait 20 seconds, and then you would have to explain it to your students. So you're giving them time to pause, reflect, find the mistake for themselves, and then correct them or, or show them where it is. And I would do that on several sentences until you felt like they got the hang of it. Okay, so now in summary, this workshop presentation had basically three objectives. One, that you as a participant will be able to apply writing instruction practices or a mini lesson that enable your students to improve the quality of their writing content using a minimal amount of class time. Two, as a participant, you'll be able to apply writing instruction practices, again, a mini lesson, that enables your students to reduce the number of mechanical errors that they have in their writing. And three, as participants, you'll be able to evaluate which grammar and punctuation errors that you need to focus on with your students. Because if you, tr if you do more than three or four, again, they'll go into cognitive overload, they will learn nothing, and they're not going to improve their quality of their writing. So, when you are responding to a stack of student papers, my hope is that this video gave you some direction so that, like cleaning up a really, really messy room, you won't feel overwhelmed or you won't try to shove it aside and not deal with it. You'll know exactly what to do with your students to help them improve the quality of their writing. Thank you.